Hey guys, today I'm going to show you how I built this portable power system for providing off-grid and emergency backup power. This is the second version of the hand truck based portable power system I've built. This one features a 5000 watt hour lithium iron phosphate UL listed battery and a 3000 watt pure sine wave inverter. The old version used an NMC battery that was more expensive and has since been discontinued. I tried to make this one as beginner friendly as possible so anybody with basic home tools and an understanding of electricity can put it together. So let's get to it. So this is the hand truck I'll be using. This is Milwaukee brand. It's 800 pounds rated. Uh, you can see it's got the D style handle in the back which allows it to lay down flat and provide easy transportation. Uh, that handle is one reason I liked this cart. In addition to these wheels, these are 10 inch rubber wheels. Some of the other carts they sell have like plastic wheels and they just don't work well through the grass. I've found these rubber wheels work very well. And uh, you'll notice this cart is used. This is the same cart from the first build video I did. And uh, even after having done that video, I would still recommend the same cart. And for the battery in this build, I'll be using the EG4 from Signature Solar. This is a 48 volt battery. It's the Life Power 4 model. It is 100 amp hours or just over 5,000 watt hours of power. And uh, interesting fact about this battery is it's now UL listed. Uh, when I did the original review video, they didn't have that certification yet, but they do have it now. And then for the inverter, I have the GrowWatt SPF 3000 TL LVM. It's a 48 volt inverter, 3000 watt pure sine wave inverter. Uh, it's got an 80 amp built in MPPT charge controller and a 40 amp AC charge controller. And uh, this is actually the first time I will be using the GrowWatt inverters. Up until now, I've pretty much been exclusively MPP solar. However, these grow watt inverters are becoming increasingly popular on the DIY market. Uh, they do look strikingly similar to MPP solar's products. The internals are likely mostly the same. So for the first step here, I'm simply going to lay the battery down flat on the hand truck. Push it down towards the bottom here. Uh, so now we have all the way of this battery being supported by the bottom part of the hand truck. And uh, having the weight fixed at the bottom will also prevent it from tipping over. And you can see how easily it picks up like that. So in the past, I've laid a piece of plywood the whole way across this hand truck and I built off that plywood. Um, there's nothing really wrong with that design, but I'm really trying to get away from, you know, having these components on wood. So in order to hold this battery into place, uh, ultimately we would drill in and, you know, put a bracket in there. But I don't want to modify the enclosure which is going to void the warranty. Uh, so I'm going to use these heavy duty zip ties. Uh, and these are often used in the HVAC industry for duct work. And you can see how large this is. It's actually about three feet in length here. So I think these will hold nicely. We will certainly find out. I'm just going to put one through each of the handles here and then around the back of the cart, making sure the battery is centered as I tighten them down. And we'll put another over here. Again, making sure the battery is centered before we tighten it down. And then we can simply trim off the excess. All right, and we can now pick up our battery and it does not slide off the front. So we might put one more along the bottom of here yet. I'm just not sure yet, but for the time being, this seems to work okay. All right, now we want the inverter to go directly above the battery. You know, we don't want it to be the whole way up to the top of the cart. Really as close to the battery as we can get it here while still allowing room to complete the connections below the inverter and on the top of the battery. You can see here that the top mounting holes of the inverter, you know, there's really nowhere to secure this inverter safely to this cart on either the top or the bottom because the width of the inverter is just barely the width of the cart on both sides. Uh, so again, since we decided not to use wood on this particular cart design, I've cut a couple pieces of unistrut or strut channel, uh, and you can pick this up at pretty much any hardware store. So I just cut two pieces here, which will go across the cart at the bottom and the top of where the inverter will sit. So we'll bolt this unistrut down to the rail of this cart, and then we have something to connect our inverter to. Uh, and I did want to say this is probably the one step you will need uh, a tool for that you may not have. I used a reciprocating saw or a sawzall. I suppose you could use a hacksaw, but uh, with how thick this metal is, you'll probably be there for a while with a hacksaw. So, uh, so I also picked up these U-bolts at Lowe's. These are part number N100-369. And these were a hair too long, so I just used a hacksaw and cut off approximately a quarter inch here. So now we can stick our bolt through the bottom. And put the top piece on 
And then it also came with a pair of nuts, so we can tighten those down. And that looks good there. I have not tightened it yet because we need to move it to position where our inverter will sit. Uh, now the opposing side is a little bit different because as you see, this bar did not line up with this post like it did on the other side. So in order to make the U-bolt fit through here, I actually drilled this extra hole here. Uh, now at first glance, I did think this design may not work too well because as you can see, there's only one tiny piece of metal in there. However, uh, when I put this top piece down here, it's actually wider than the hole and longer than the hole. So when this clamps down, it's going to clamp down the entire perimeter of this uh, metal piece, if that makes sense. All right, so now we can sit down our inverter and position these rails exactly where we want them here. So I'm going to start with the top side here first, and the reason for that is uh, the two mounting holes for the inverter do not obstruct the bolts for the U-bolt clamp here. So I can clamp this inverter down to this rail and then continue to move it up and down while I situate the lower rail. So I'm just going to make two approximate marks here where the bolts will go. And then to secure the inverter to this rail, uh, I'm going to use these cone nuts. And uh, these are called cone nuts because it has this little plastic cone which holds the nut in place on the unistrut or super strut rail. So I'm just going to put one cone nut at each mark that I made on the strut channel. And supposedly all I have to do is push it into the rail and then twist it a quarter turn to lock it into place. All right, that wasn't too bad. Now I have the first nut in place. Now we can set the inverter back down here. And then for the hardware, I have quarter inch bolts. These are three quarter inches in length and uh, just a simple flat washer. And we'll just leave those a little loose for now until we complete tightening down the bottom rail. All right, guys, I ran into a small issue with my plan here as I'm putting this together for the bottom support bracket. Because of where the factory holes are, you can see one there down there. I cannot slide the cone nut over far enough because it's running into the nut for the U-bolt here. Quarter of an inch too short. I ended up punching two new holes. You can see one is right there and one is right there. Slightly larger hole so that I could move the cone nuts inward a little bit. I mean that works well. I was really hoping to do this with minimal modifications to the products. However, you know, it just it wasn't working with the choice of U-bolt I'm using. And you can see the mounting bolt down there is in place. Uh, so now we are ready to tighten down our U-bolts at the top and to tighten down the top clamp of the inverter. All right, I'll tell you what, it's gotten quite heavier for sure, but uh, man, that feels pretty solid. I like it. All right, now we're ready to start talking about the electrical connection. The first we need to make is the main positive and negative of this battery to the inverter. So the very first step I'm going to do here is ensure the circuit breaker on the battery is turned off. That will ensure there is no power present on these battery terminals. So for this connection, I'm using number four gauge, that's American wire gauge cable. And what you need is approximately 18 inches or one and a half feet of cable, number four gauge, and either a one quarter or a three eighths inch lug on the end. Uh, so I'm just going to loose fit it at first. I'm going to feed the negative into the hole for the negative cable here. Uh, and it's kind of hard to see, so I'll show you what I did here. You can see the negative is sitting on the terminal mark negative. This is the positive over here. It is very important that those two terminals not be mixed up. Now we can go ahead and place the negative terminal on the battery. And we just have a small bolt to put through here. And we can tighten down that bolt. And by the way, both the bolt on the battery and the nut on the inverter are 10 millimeter size socket. And the positive lead goes on the positive terminal, obviously. And then we can connect that to the positive of the battery. When I make this connection, I'm going to be careful this wire is not obstructing the circuit breaker down here uh, because we don't want it to prevent this circuit breaker from tripping if there were a fault. Now we're ready to talk about the AC wiring for this project. And for that, I'm pretty much going to stick to just this AC power strip. Uh, I wanted this project to remain as simple as possible, so I didn't want to do like a uh, breaker panel or anything like that this time. Now this power strip was a bit pricey, however I wanted the capability of using up to 20 amps. I didn't want a 15 amp power strip and I wanted to make sure it had overcurrent protection and this power strip does have built in protection. And additionally I wanted to make sure it had the wiring to support the capacity of the power strip. This is 12 gauge wire which is sufficient for 20 amps. Some of the extension cords and things like that in the market, you'll get like a 50 foot extension cord and then find it has 16 gauge wire and that's just not good enough. So what we're going to do is uh, cut just enough cable off to connect the power strip to the inverter and the remaining cord with the male plug on will be used for the AC input. So on the top of the cart here, I put a third piece of strut channel. So we're just going to affix our power strip to the top of the cart like so. 
that definitely is not going anywhere. It's on there pretty tight. So that's, that'll work nicely. So I'm going to nicely route the cable up the side of the inverter here and then make sure I leave plenty left over to go into the inverter. So now you can see how I've cut back some insulation here and I've stripped off the three conductors. We have a green or ground, our black which is our line or hot, and our white which is our neutral. So on the inverter here you see the top is labeled AC input and the bottom is labeled AC output. We have the first pin, it's a ground symbol, so that's where the green wire is going to go. The L or line is where the black wire will go and the N or neutral is where the white wire will go. It's very important this be connected correctly and this is the step where we're starting to deal with AC and slightly higher voltages so if you're not sure or not comfortable to contact an electrician to have this work done. All right that was actually quite a bit uh, difficult to get those connectors in because they're all the way down in this case and there's not a lot of room to get your fingers in there so and I have that wire zip tied in multiple places along the path here just to ensure it does not get pulled and it is well restrained. And we're going to use all of this leftover cord for the AC input, so we'll have a nice long power input in case we want to AC charge or run this device on grid power. Uh, so I'm going to connect that the same way. I'll strip a bit of the wire back and I'll put it into the AC input terminals. All right, so you can see I've completed the AC input connections there. And both input and output come out. And I've got them zip tied twice to the front of this battery pack here. And... Uh, Optimally, there would be like a cable gland down here that would tighten down around the cable and grip the cable as a strain relief. Uh, this inverter didn't come with that. I could probably find them on like Mouser or something, but... Okay, so the last connection we have to make in this inverter is the PV or solar input. Now, because this is a mobile device, we need some way to easily connect and disconnect that input without having to take these screws out every single time. Uh, so I ordered this piece of MC4 cable. This is an MC4 extension with actual PV rated wire. So I'm just going to cut it right in the middle here. So now I've got two connectors I can use for my input and two stripped off ends I can connect to the inverter. It's very important to ensure these connectors don't get mixed up. If you mix up the polarity of these connectors, you will, will damage your inverter and you don't want that to happen. So on the solar panel output, this is your positive connector and this is your negative connector. However, those polarities are in reference to the solar panel. Because we're now in reference to the device uh, that the solar panel is plugging into, we need to swap these connectors. So we're going to connect the pointy connector to the negative and the rectangular connector to the positive. It wouldn't hurt to use a voltmeter just to double check your solar panel and double check your wiring before you connect these for the first time. So again, the strain relief on these connections is very important. So you see I have it zip tied here twice. Then we're just going to loop the excess around and we can stow it underneath until we're ready to use our solar input. So now after double and triple checking all of our wiring, we're ready to turn it on for the first time. So the very first step is to turn the circuit breaker on for our battery. And once that's done, we can go ahead and turn our inverter on. Uh, we can see our inverter has started up. The battery is pretty much dead, so we're going to have to charge that soon. And we're outputting 120 volts. So now we come up to our power strip and we can flick that on. I see a light, so that's good news. All right, so the very first setting I want to change on this inverter is to disable the beeping. So this is the beeping I'm talking about. Now, if you look up here, there is a little speaker symbol. All you have to do is hold down the down and the enter keys. And you'll see that speaker symbol shuts off. And now you can press the buttons without hearing that annoying beeping noise. Uh, so taking a look at our manual here, pretty much all the settings this has programmed as defaults are acceptable. Uh, utility first for the priority mode. Maximum charge current default is 60 amps. Uh, the battery type is defaulted to AGM, so we're going to want to switch that to user defined for now. Um, I have not tried communications between this battery and this inverter. We may set that up in a separate video, uh, but for the time being I want to change number 5 battery type to USE or user defined. So to change the parameters, we press and hold enter. We go down to number five, and we'll change that to USE. So max utility charge current is important. We want to make sure the charge current we're charging at does not exceed the 20 amp plug we installed on it. So 30 amps DC is less than 20 amps at the AC voltage, so that's good. And then we've got our charge constant voltage, our floating voltage. These are all acceptable. Low cutoff defaults to 42. Uh, these are all acceptable for now. You're welcome to play with these settings and change them as you wish. So now I'd like to do a bit of load testing on this. I'll probably try to start the air compressor, maybe a power tool or two. But before we do that, we do need to charge up this battery because it is at pretty much 0% state of charge currently. So I've plugged this into a 20 amp receptacle. 
and we can see over on the inverter we are charging. All right, so I've got my Cobalt 1.8 horsepower air compressor here uh, plugged into the portable power station. Um, and this is probably the heaviest 120 volt load I have. So if it starts this air compressor, I have no doubt it will run a refrigerator, a freezer, an air conditioner. So inverter is on, power strip is on, here we go. The inverter fans did kick on and they are quite loud. Uh, however, it had no problem starting it at all. It was very clean start and it sounded great. Some inverters I've plugged this into, you can just kind of tell they're struggling uh, just based on how the air compressor sounds. But yeah, it's not really too exciting of a test, but again, uh, no problem starting a heavy inductive load. Guys, this is a super cool build and it's probably one of my favorite yet. The strut channel provided much better support for the inverter and the components than the original plywood base setup. Not only will this work for off-grid solar use, it is perfect for emergency backup scenarios, such as during a natural disaster or otherwise uh, long-term extended power outage. You can very easily wheel this hand truck into your garage for storage, pull it out once in a while, cycle it, use it now and then, um, have it ready for use if the power were to go out. And if you do run into a scenario where you have an extended outage, it's great because you can easily plug in solar panels and use the sun for power. And this inverter is powerful enough to power most of your critical loads, including the refrigerator, the freezer, you know, a microwave, and even small window air conditioners this thing can power. In these videos, viewers are typically asking for a breakdown of price. So let's go through how much this costs. This battery sells for $1,500. This inverter sells for $660. Now, if you're local to Texas, you can actually go out and pick these up at Signature Solar. Um, and they won't charge you anything for shipping, however I am not. So freight shipping to the Northeast will run you approximately $300 and that will vary based on your location. Uh, this hand truck was $85 at Lowe's, this power strip was about $50, and then I'll add in another $50 for the miscellaneous components such as the cabling for the batteries, uh, the strut channel, and the U-bolts. So the total out the door for this build comes to just under $2,700. That is not a bad deal for what you get. These batteries, these lithium iron phosphate batteries will last a long time. Uh, so yeah, let me know what you guys think. If you have any improvements you would add to it, I will leave links down in the video description to where you can purchase all of these components. Uh, please, please hit that like button before you go. It really helps the channel and the videos. And thank you for watching.